A poll tax, also known as a head tax or capitation, is a tax of a uniform, fixed amount applied to an individual in accordance with the census. Head taxes were important sources of revenue for many governments from ancient times until the 19th century. They have also been used in the past, notably in the United States, to disenfranchise minority voters. In the United Kingdom, poll taxes were levied by the governments of John of Gaunt in the 14th century, Charles II in the 17th and Margaret Thatcher in the 20th century. Mosaic law, as prescribed in Exodus Jewish law imposed a poll tax of half shekel, payable by every man above the age of 20. Exodus 30 11 to 16, 11 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Twelve when thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord, when thou numberest them. That there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them. Thirteen this they shall give, every one that passeth among them that are numbered, half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Fourteen every one that passeth among them that are numbered, from twenty years old and above, shall give an offering unto the Lord. Fifteen the rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, when they give an offering unto the Lord, to make an atonement for your souls. Sixteen and thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shalt appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. That it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord, to make an atonement for your souls. The money was designated for the tabernacle in the Exodus narrative and later for the upkeep of the Temple of Jerusalem. Priests, women, slaves and minors were exempted, although they could offer it voluntarily. Payment by Samaritans or Gentiles was rejected. It was collected yearly during the month of Adar, both at the temple and at Special Collection Bureau in the provinces. Imperial China All of the dynasties of Imperial China have a policy of poll tax, means the male, especially the male empowers whose age is 16 a euro 55. In 1713, a policy which is about the cancellation of poll tax of Kangxi Emperor. Furthermore, Kangxi Emperor said no poll tax forever with the birth rates was increased in China. ECUAI one quarter or a degree of ashi cubed. The influence of this policy is the population change of China about 100 millions in 1682 to 400 millions in 1912. Roman Empire The ancient Romans imposed a tributum capitas as one of the principal direct taxes on the peoples of the Roman provinces. In the Republican period, Poll taxes were principally collected by private tax farmers, but from the time of Emperor Augustus, the collections were gradually transferred to magistrates and the senates of provincial cities. The Roman census was conducted periodically in the provinces to draw up and update the poll tax register. The Roman poll tax fell principally on Roman subjects in the provinces, but not on Roman citizens. Towns in the provinces who possessed the Jus Italicum were exempted from the poll tax. The 212 Edict of Emperor Caracalla which formally conferred Roman citizenship on all residents of Roman provinces, did not however exempt them from the poll tax. The Roman poll tax was deeply resented, Tertullian bewailed the poll tax as a badge of slavery and it provoked numerous revolts in the provinces. Perhaps most famous is the Zealot Revolt in Judea of 66 AD. After the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the emperor imposed an extra poll tax on Jews throughout the empire, the Fiscus Judaicus, of two denarii in each. The Italian revolt of the 720s, organized and led by Pope Gregory II, was originally provoked by the attempt of the Constantinople Emperor Leo III the Isaurian to introduce a poll tax in the Italian provinces of the Byzantine Empire in 722, and set in motion the permanent separation of Italy from the Byzantine Empire. When King Astolf of the Lombards availed himself of the Italian descent and invaded the Exorcate of Ravenna in 751, one of his first acts was to institute a crashing poll tax of one gold salidus per head on every Roman citizen. Seeking relief from this burden, Pope Stephen II appealed to pin the short of the Franks for assistance, that led to the establishment of the Papal States in 756. Islamic Law Jizya is a poll tax imposed under Islamic law on non-Muslims, specifically, the Dhimmi. 
the tax is levied on free-born able-bodied men of military age. The poor are exempt, as well as those who are not independent or wealthy, such as slaves, women, children, the old, the sick, monks and hermits. There are several legal rationales for the jizya. The common argument is that jizya was a fee in exchange for the dhimma. Other rationales assume such rights were every person's birthright, and the imposition of jizya on non-Muslims similar to the imposition of zakat on Muslims. Although jizya is designated as a poll tax, its assessment and collection is often qualified by income. For instance, Amr ibn Alas, after conquering Egypt, set up a census to measure the population for the jizya, and thus the total expected jizya revenue for the whole province, but organized the actual collection by partitioning the population into wealth classes, so that the rich paid more and the poor less jizya of the total sum. Elsewhere, it is reported customary to partition into three classes, for example 48 dirhams for the rich, 24 for middle class and 12 for the poor. In 1855, the Ottoman Empire abolished the jizya tax, as part of reforms to equalize the status of Muslims and non-Muslims. It was replaced, however, by a military exemption tax on non-Muslims, the Bedal i Askiri. England and Scotland, the poll tax was essentially a lay subsidy to help fund war. It had first been levied in 1275 and continued, under different names, until the 17th century. People were taxed a percentage of the assessed value of their movable goods. The percentage varied from year to year and place to place, and which goods could be taxed differed between urban and rural locations. Churchmen were exempt, as were the poor, workers in the Royal Mint, inhabitants of the Sink Ports, tin workers in Cornwall and Devon, and those who lived in the Palatinate counties of Cheshire and Durham. Equals 14th century equals, the Hillary Parliament, held between January and March 1377, levied a poll tax in 1377 to finance the war against France at the request of John of Gaunt who, since King Edward III was mortally sick, was the de facto head of government at the time. This tax covered almost 60% of the population, far more than lay subsidies had earlier. It was levied two more times after 1377, in 1379 and 1381. Each time the taxation basis was slightly different. In 1377, every lay person over the age of 14 years who was not a beggar had to pay a groat to the crown. By 1379 that had been graded by social class, with the lower age limit changed to 16, and to 15 two years later. The levy of 1381 operated under a combination of both flat rate and graduated assessments. The minimum amount payable was set at 4d, However tax collectors had to account for a 12 da head mean assessment. Payments were therefore variable. The poorest in theory would pay the lowest rate with the deficit being met by a higher payment from those able to afford it. The 1381 tax has been credited as one of the main reasons behind the peasants' revolt in 1380, due in part to attempts to restore feudal conditions in rural areas. Equals 17th century equals the poll tax was resurrected during the 17th century, usually related to a military emergency. It was imposed by Charles I in 1641 to finance the raising of the army against the Scottish and Irish uprisings. With the restoration of Charles II in 1660, the Convention Parliament of 1660 instituted a poll tax to finance the disbanding of the new model army. The poll tax was assessed according to rank. For example, dukes paid a £100, earls a £60, knights a £20, esquires a £10. Eldest sons paid two thirds RDS of their father's rank, widows paid a third of their late husband's rank. The members of the livery companies paid according to company's rank. Professionals also paid differing rates, for example, physicians, judges, advocates, attorneys, and so on. Anyone with property paid 40 shillings per a 100 pounds earned, anyone over the age of 16 and unmarried paid 12 pence and everyone else over 16 paid 6 pence. The poll tax was imposed again by William and Mary in 1689, reassessed in 1690 adjusting rank for fortune, and then again in 1691 back to rank irrespective of fortune. The poll tax was imposed again in 1692, 
and one final time in 1698. A poll tax was imposed on Scotland between 1694 and 1699. As the greater weight of the 17th century poll taxes fell primarily upon the wealthy and powerful, it was not too unpopular. There were grumblings within the taxed ranks about lack of differentiation by income within ranks. Ultimately, it was the inefficiency of their collection, what they brought in routinely fell far short of expected revenues, that prompted the government to abandon the poll tax after 1698. Far more controversial was the hearth tax introduced in 1662, which imposed a hefty two shillings on every hearth in the family dwelling. Heavier, more permanent and more regressive than the poll tax proper, the intrusive entry of tax inspectors into private homes to count hearths was a very sore point, and it was promptly repealed with a glorious revolution in 1689. It was replaced with a window tax in 1695. Equals United Kingdom equals. The poll tax, officially known as the community charge, was a tax to fund local government in the United Kingdom, instituted in 1989 by the government of Margaret Thatcher. It replaced the rates that were based on the notional rental value of a house. The abolition of rates was in the manifesto of Thatcher's Conservative Party in the 1979 general election, and the replacement was proposed in the Green Paper of 1986 paying for local government based on ideas developed by Dr. Madsen Parry and Douglas Mason of the Adam Smith Institute. It was a fixed tax per adult resident, but there was a reduction for those with lower household income. Each person was to pay for the services provided in their community. This proposal was contained in the Conservative Manifesto for the 1987 general election. The new tax replaced the rates in Scotland from the start of the 1989-90 financial year, and in England and Wales from the start of the 1990-91 financial year. The system was unpopular. Many thought it shifted the tax burden from the rich to the poor, as it was based on the number of people living in a house rather than on the house's estimated price. Many tax rates set by local councils proved to be much higher than earlier predictions. This led to resentment even among some who had supported it. The tax in different boroughs differed because local taxes paid by businesses varied and grants by central government to local authorities sometimes varied capriciously. Mass protests were called by the All-Britain Anti-Poll Tax Federation, with which the vast majority of local anti-poll tax unions were affiliated. In Scotland the APTUs called for mass non-payment and these calls rapidly gathered widespread support which spread to England and Wales, even though non-payment meant that people could be prosecuted. In some areas, 30% of former ratepayers defaulted. While owner-occupiers were easy to tax, those who regularly changed accommodation were almost impossible to pursue if they chose not to pay. The cost of collecting the tax rose steeply while the returns from it fell. Unrest grew and resulted in a number of poll tax riots. The most serious was in a protest at Trafalgar Square, London, on March 31, 1990, of more than 200,000 protesters. A Labour MP, Terry Fields, was jailed for 60 days for refusing to pay his poll tax. This unrest led, in part, to the end of Thatcher's premiership. Her successor, John Major, replaced the poll tax with the council tax similar to the rating system that preceded the poll tax. The main differences were that it was levied on capital value rather than notional rental value of a property, and that it had a 25% discount for single occupancy dwellings. France, in France, a poll tax, the capitation, was first imposed by King Louis XIV in 1695 as a temporary measure to finance the War of the League of Augsburg, and thus repealed in 1699. It was resumed during the War of Spanish Succession and in 1704 set on a permanent basis, remaining until the end of the Ancien Regime. Like the English poll tax, the French capitation tax was assessed on rank a euro for taxation persons, French society was divided in 22 classes, with the Dauphin paying 2,000 livres, princes of their blood paying 1,500 livres, and so on down to the lowest class, composed of day laborers and servants who paid one livre each. The bulk of the common population was covered by four classes, paying 40, 30, 10 and 3 livre respectively. 
Unlike most other direct French taxes, nobles and clergy were not exempted from capitation taxes. It did, however, exempt the mendicant orders and the poor who contributed less than 40 sous. The French clergy managed to temporarily escape capitation assessment by promising to pay a total sum of 4 million livres per annum in 1695, and then obtained permanent exemption in 1709 with a lump sum payment of 24 million livres. The Pays d'A copyright acts and many towns also escaped assessment by promising annual fixed payments. The nobles did not escape assessment, but they obtained the right to appoint their own capitation tax assessors, which allowed them to escape most of the burden. Compounding the burden, the assessment on the capitation did not remain stable. The Pays de Tail personnel secured the ability to assess the capitation tax proportionally to the tail which effectively meant adjusting the burden heavily against the lower classes. According to the estimates of Jacques Necker in 1788, the capitation tax was so riddled in practice, that the privileged classes were largely exempt, while the lower classes were heavily crushed. The lowest peasant class, originally assessed to pay three livres, were now paying twenty-four, the second lowest, assessed at ten livres, were now paying 60 and the third lowest assessed at 30 were paying 180. The total collection from the capitation, according to Necker in 1788, was 41 million livres, well short of the 54 million estimate, and it was projected that the revenues could have doubled if the exemptions were revoked and the original 1695 assessment properly restored. The old capitation tax was repealed with the French Revolution and replaced in November 23, 1790, with a new poll tax as part of the contribution personal mobiliary, which lasted well into the late 19th century. It was fixed for every individual at three days' labor. A dwelling tax was imposed in 1791. Russia, Russia imposed a poll tax in 1718. United States. Equals poll tax equals. Prior to the mid-20th century, a poll tax was implemented in some U.S. state and local jurisdictions and paying it was a precondition before one could exercise their right to vote. After this right was extended to all races by the ratification of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, many southern states enacted poll tax laws as a means of restricting eligible voters. Such laws often included a grandfather clause, which allowed any adult male whose father or grandfather had voted in a specific year prior to the abolition of slavery to vote without paying the tax. These laws, along with unfairly implemented literacy tests and extra legal intimidation, achieved the desired effect of disenfranchising African American, as well as poor whites. Often in U.S. discussions, the term poll tax is used to mean a tax that must be paid in order to vote, rather than a capitation tax simply. The 24th Amendment, ratified in 1964, prohibits both Congress and the states from conditioning the right to vote on payment of a poll tax or other types of tax. Equals capitation and federal taxation equals. The ninth section of Article I of the Constitution places several limits on Congress powers. Among them, no capitation, or other direct, tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. Capitation here means a tax of a uniform, fixed amount per taxpayer. Direct tax means a tax levied directly by the United States federal government on taxpayers, as opposed to a tax on events or transactions. The United States government levied direct taxes from time to time during the 18th and early 19th centuries. It levied direct taxes on the owners of houses, land, slaves and estates in the late 1790s but cancelled the taxes in 1802. An income tax is neither a poll tax nor a capitation, as the amount of tax will vary from person to person, depending on each person's income. Until a United States Supreme Court decision in 1895, all income taxes were deemed to be excises. The Revenue Act of 1861 established the first income tax in the United States, to pay for the cost of the American Civil War. This income tax was abolished after the war, in 1872. Another income tax statute in 1894 was overturned in Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trust Company in 1895, where the Supreme Court held that income taxes on income from property, such as rent income, 
interest income, and dividend income were to be treated as direct taxes. Because the statute in question had not apportioned income taxes on income from property by population, the statute was ruled unconstitutional. Finally, ratification of the 16th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1913 made possible modern income taxes, by placing the income tax firmly in the class of indirect excises, thus needing no apportionment, a practice that would remain unchanged into the 21st century. In an editorial published by the Wall Street Journal in 2012, historian and author Dr. Paul Marino argued that the requirement of all Americans to purchase health insurance or face a penalty could be construed as a direct tax that must be apportioned and thus unconstitutional. Chief Justice John Roberts rejected this reasoning and this rationale was not cited in any dissenting justices' opinions. New Zealand the numbers of the Chinese immigration went from 20,000 a year to 8 people after the government imposed head tax. New Zealand imposed a poll tax on Chinese immigrants during the 19th and early 20th centuries. The poll tax was effectively lifted in the 1930s following the invasion of China by Japan, and was finally repealed in 1944. Prime Minister Helen Clark offered New Zealand's Chinese community an official apology for the poll tax on February 12, 2002. See also, hot tax, fixed tax, disfranchisement after Reconstruction era, Corver copyright e. References External links, Middle Ages poll tax, pictures by Paul Ross, who witnessed the riots, the battle that brought down Thatcher, a perspective by the Trotskyist militant group.